Good morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earthen Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. Today, I want to address a very common uh, phenomenon that is happening these days as we enter the time of the one world global religion. That would be the phenomenon of goddess worship being increasingly accepted in the, the churches that call themselves Christian. Now, the most obvious way that this manifests to most people who believe in God's word is the incidence of Mary worship in the Catholic Church. But today I want to cover it from a different point of view. And there are people who like to uh, say things like that God had a wife. And this is actually pretty common in the world. There are various documentaries done by the History Channel and, and such like where they claim to have found evidence that God had a wife. And for that reason, we as Christians need to be educated about what the scripture says. Because whenever we encounter something that can mislead us or deceive us, this is where we turn. We turn to God's word. And of course, uh, people who, who espouse these kinds of views often pervert and twist the meaning of scripture in order to prove their false doctrine. Now, I just want to make one statement first that will emphasize the importance of this topic. And that is that as we're entering the very last hours of the last days and the final deception that will overtake all mankind where people will worship the beast and they'll worship the Antichrist and they'll worship the dragon, it's my understanding that the way this will take form for Christians is to insert the idea of goddess worship into the commonly held practice in Trinitarian false churches, that the Holy Spirit is a separate being from the deity who is the one true God, the Father. And what they will do, in my opinion, what I'm seeing happening on unfolding before me, is that they will insert the idea that the Holy Spirit is actually the divine feminine. And for this reason, it's very important that those who are in faith be able to contend with this the way the scripture tells us to. So let's begin in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8. And, and may the Lord bless the reading of his word. And of course, I always use the King James Version of the Holy Bible, because if you speak English, this is the perfect and holy word of God, and other translations are not. Let's begin in Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 1. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places, and by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. So, uh, there are many things in this particular chapter about wisdom, but the Gnostic people, the people who believe in incorporating world religions and, and pagan practices into Christianity, which is Gnosticism. That, that people who believe that way use passages like this, where wisdom is referred to as a feminine, so that the, the feminine pronouns are used here. And they use this in order to say things such as that, there was a wife of God. There is a divine feminine. Her name is Wisdom. And to the Gnostics, of course, her name would be Sophia or Gaia or Ashtoreth or Isis or and 
Diana is another one. So the wisdom goddess is something that belongs to paganism. And the scripture is not referring to Diana or Ashtoreth or Sophia here. What the scripture is referring to is something entirely different, which we can understand very easily. So in verse 22 of this chapter, we read, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. Where there were no depth, depths, I was brought forth. Where there no, were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. So this is speaking that wisdom was present with God before anything was made. Does this mean that wisdom is a, an, another aspect of the Trinity? So is this speaking of the Holy Spirit? Is this speaking of the Holy Spirit in a way where it's feminine? Is this the wife of God? Well, when we read the scripture, we have to understand a few things about language. And this is not the whole of what I'm going to say here. So please do not stop this video after I make this statement, because this does not answer the charges that people are making, that, that God has three persons, and one of them, the Holy Spirit, would be the divine feminine. Okay, But we do need to understand that in language, often, in, in many languages, Spanish, for example, that many nouns have a, a feminine to them. So, for example, in English, it might be that we refer to ships as being a female. We refer to churches as being female. We refer to uh, hurricanes, or we used to anyway. We used to refer to hurricanes as female until the... The feminists found that to be upsetting, so we had to change that. But basically, there are many things that people refer to in the feminine in, in various languages because there are aspects of that thing that they're speaking of that are feminine. And that's why the language does it that way. And this is true also of the Hebrew language, that, that the, the word in Hebrew that is wisdom is a feminine word, and there's a reason why. So what is it about wisdom that's feminine? So to understand that, we can go again to the scripture. First, let's read in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. <clears throat> Pardon me. But with the lowly is wisdom. So one aspect of wisdom in a human being is that it involves humility and obedience to God. And this is, of course, something that is a feminine pr principle throughout the Bible. For example, in, in the New Testament, in the book of Ephesians, when the Apostle Paul is talking about the roles of men and women and the submission of the wife to the husband and, and the husband's love for his wife, that the woman being sub in subjection to her husband is a picture of the church being in, in subjection to Jesus Christ. So the church, of course, as, is referred to as feminine. Does this mean that only women are in the church? Well, of course not. It's talking about the principle of subjection. So wisdom is something that is alluded to as being feminine because in a human wisdom is in subjection to God's laws and God's principles. Now the opposite of that of course would be pride. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 6 and we'll begin in verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, 
and hands that shed innocent blood. An heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. So what is being spoken of here is, of course, the opposite of subjection, which is pride or rebellion or self-will. All of these things that God hates have to do with people's own self-will and their own pride rising up against God's law. Another aspect of subjection and, and the divine um, concept of how he created mankind to be in subjection to his law is in chapter 7 of Proverbs, and we read, beginning in verse 1, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. So one thing we can perceive that is being spoken of here is obedience, that that to to have God's law written in our hearts is and to have his commandments in our hearts is something, but obedience is also necessary, which we read in the next verse. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. And then we read in verse 4, Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. Now, obviously, this one verse here establishes that when we're speaking about wisdom being feminine, that it's about the, the way it is a, a, a way of subjection. And, and it's a feminine principle. So when we, as human beings, say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, this is certainly not goddess worship. It's talking about be, being in a relationship with wisdom where we recognize that it's a feminine principle, principle of obedience and adhering to God's laws and commandments and call understanding thy kinswoman. So we can understand now that wisdom being referred to in the feminine has nothing to do with God having a wife. Now let's address the issue of wisdom being present with God before the earth was created, before anything was created. And we'll go now to Psalm 104, and we will read verse 24. It says, O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So wisdom is something that is evidenced in God's creation. That wisdom is a character attribute of the Father. Now, this in no way is a separate entity. Wisdom is not capitalized here. It is not speaking of another entity who was present with God when he made the world. When I have wisdom, that doesn't mean that I have another part of me that is a separate personality. And God did not have dissociative identity disorder. He did not have multiple personality disorder. As the Trinitarians like to concoct a whole theology based on, on errors such as this, the, the passage in Proverbs 8 where wisdom is referred to in, in a way where it seems it's another entity. What, what this is talking about, really, is that wisdom is an attribute of God and that it's an eternal attribute, that everything that God made has wisdom in it because he has wisdom. And with wisdom comes beauty, comes order, and, and the kind of things where 
where we can see that God's laws are good for us to obey. So the laws of the universe are wise. If the law of the universe says things to us that, for example, to try to acquire for, uh, forbidden knowledge or the forbidden fruit, that this brings death, understanding that and being in subjection to God's commandment brings life. It protects us from harm, but it also brings life. The tree of life in the garden is God's word. And those who not only understand God's word, but obey it, these are, are the people who build their house upon a rock. This is the foundation that we need. We need to understand that God's word is holy and perfect and pure. And when we obey it, this brings life to us. And when we disobey it, it brings death. So wisdom being something that was present with God simply means that God is wise and everything that he made was sprung forth in wisdom by his word. Now let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 1 and we will read beginning in verse 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now just note here this does not say God the spirit. It's saying the spirit of God. So God is a spirit, obviously, and God is holy, obviously. So God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, so God spoke, let there be light, and there was light. Now, when God spoke, he spoke the word, and the word also was with God. The word is not a separate entity known as the Logos or God the Son. God's word was with him in the same way that wisdom was with him. It's part of how he operates. And the way God made the wor world was to speak it into being with his word. So his word is truth. When we obey his words, we are wise. So here we can see that God is the source of wisdom. And humans, people, to be wise, must be in subjection to his laws and his commandments. Otherwise, we partake of things that will kill us. Anything that is out of God's order is sin, and any sin leads to death. Throughout the book of Proverbs, we see this contrast between the wisdom of God and the folly of men. And the wisdom of God in a man or a woman is about being in God's word and obeying God's word. It's about being in subjection to God. So if we read in verse 18, pride, oh, 18 of chapter 16. Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He that handleth the matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. So we can understand that wisdom and words are connected. So we, we can read some of the ways that, that words can be used in a prideful way and and we can start with verse 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. He 
that laboreth, laboreth for himself, for his mouth craveth, craveth it of him. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is as a burning fire. A froward man, which means someone who is rebellious, soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. A violent man enticeth his neighbor, and leadeth him into a way, the way that is not good. He shutteth his eyes to devise froward things. Moving his lips, he bringeth evil to pass. So we can understand that there is a connection between wisdom and words. God's wisdom is in God's word. And when God spoke the world into being with his word, his wisdom was then present throughout. Wisdom in a human being comes from obedience to God's laws and commandments. And when one is obedient, that brings life. When one is disobedient and arrogant and proud and outside of God's commandments, disobedient to his order, that brings death. So the reason why wisdom is referred to in the feminine is because wisdom is something that in a person is uh, something about, it's about subjection, it's about obedience, which is a feminine principle. That does not mean, however, that God has male and female parts, that God is both male and female, which is also something that is widely taught these days. Uh, God is not part female either, and, and we can read of that in Psalm 139. So let's, t let's understand the wisdom of God. In Psalm 139 and verse 4, we begin reading here, it says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. And then if we continue in verse 14, we read about the wisdom of God and how he made the world, in particular how he made people. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written. Which, is, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. So in God's book, all my members were written. This is speaking about God's word and how God's word knew the end from the beginning. That God, When God formed the world by his word, it's, it was all done before it ever started. That that is the wisdom of God. And the presence of wisdom with God has nothing to do with, with a divine feminine. It has to do with who God is, the eternal and holy Father. Then in verse 17 we read, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! And then we read in verse 23, Search me, O God! and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way 
in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So the difference between God's wisdom and human wisdom is that God's wisdom is eternal and it's too high for us to understand. It's something that 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 we can't escape. It's so big that it is everywhere. It's throughout his creation, God's wisdom is. And the, the way for us to have wisdom is to be led by him in the way of life, in the way everlasting. It has to do with subjection. So wisdom is a feminine principle in, in people. But in God, it's something that is eternal and life-giving and something that is really too high for us to comprehend. Now, there are many parts of the scripture that refer to other things as being female. For exa example, in the, the book of James, and we'll just turn there quickly to, to show that this is the case. In James chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, we read, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. So patience has her perfect work in a Christian who in faith continues to follow God's commandments, to be, walk in obedience to him, on a daily basis. This doesn't mean that patience is a goddess. It means that patient, patience has a feminine principle to it and that it has to do with being in subjection. So I hope that this has clarified the matter of the divine feminine, the existence of a, a wisdom goddess that was God's wife at the time of creation, and certainly to, to um, address the fallacy that the Holy Spirit is this wisdom goddess, something that will be brought forward very soon in the world, where people who have fallen for the Trinity delusion will be led into a, a new understanding that, that the Holy Spirit is the divine feminine as known by the Gnostics. And when this happens, when they worship the Holy Spirit in that way, that is where Satan steps in and receives the worship. Satan has never had a problem masquerading as a female, be it Ashtoreth, be it Mary, be it Ishtar, that, that Satan has done this for a very long time. The, the Luciferian figure that will come will have aspects of both man and woman. It will be a Baphomet figure. So the, the world messiah, the world teacher that will manifest to different religions will manifest as having characteristics of both male and female. And that is why, of course, we are having this um, transgender movement now to make this palatable to people. It makes it acceptable. People are becoming used to the idea uh, of it being perfectly fine for someone to be androgynous or both male and female. So when we're seeing these things unfold, it's very important to understand gender as the Bible describes it. And that when we hear of um, a church being described as female, it's because of the church's role in relation to Jesus Christ, a role of subjection. And it has absolutely nothing to do with goddess worship. I remain here for you. If you have further questions, feel free to email me. I usually get back to people within a couple of days, God willing. And also feel free to comment in the comment section below. I look forward to hearing from you, and all of you remain in my prayers.